all right, would you rather get an extra 50K budget to spend on whatever you want in your studio or have a live active shark as one of your arms? <laughs> Wait, what? Would I prefer to have 50 grand or a shark arm? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking 50 grand, dude. Why would I want a shark arm? I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. This is, this is your question. Like, <laughs> shark, shark arm? Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm his manager, Anand Harsh, broadcasting to you on, what is it, day 680 of quarantine. I've invented a new drink, which is six parts Everclear, one part ketchup. It's called the Extremely Bloody and Probably Already Dead Mary. Alcohol is my greatest friend and terrifying enemy in this bleak new existence. On a brighter note, Bill's guest today is a very old friend of his, Tom Cosm, producer and performer out of New Zealand. These guys have both been producing Ableton tutorials since way back in the day before it became cool, and they're just good friends, so they prattled on and on. Nice long episode for you. They've also released a bunch of music together, including the Entanglement series, which spawned my sad Will Smith meme in the Beleagle Immigrants group, of which I am particularly fond. If you're not a member, you should join. Patreon subscribers will be thrilled to learn that we just recorded our first bonus episode for members of the Enabler and the Enabled tier and higher. If you want behind the scenes insights on Bill and his career, there's no way it could get more inside baseball than this episode and the ones to come. You still have the opportunity to subscribe and support the show and get in on those bonus apps. Visit patreon.com slash Mr. Bill's Tunes, and we thank you very much for doing so. Go to mrbillstunes.com to sign up as a hardcore Abletoneer. You get full access to Bill's project files and tutorials, and I know you'll be super inspired to do so after this conversation. So, without any further ado, I present to you Mr. Bill and Tom Cosm. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. fuck yeah man um sick well yeah thanks thanks for doing the the podcast man i know it took us a while to to get one going i, I tried to I, I wanted to do one in melbourne when i was there last with you but uh the vibe wasn't right i guess yeah what happened was that was that my fault or yeah i think you, you said you weren't i don't know yeah shit was a bit hectic and i think you said at the time you you, you weren't feeling it or whatever which is fine yeah yeah it's uh i don't often talk to the internet very much at the moment so i'm a little bit out of practice to be honest but um right which is kind of weird because you were like the the first guy to talk to the internet yeah one of the first <laughs> maybe in the um in the sense of uh, audio production um i'm mm. sure there were many before me right yeah I, I remember um being at a at a festival in new zealand uh, it was like that Equinox Festival or whatever that Muzz got me out for in 2010 or something like that. And I remember like, oh yeah. And I remember asking for like your blessing to do Ableton tutorials. That's so I was like, I was like, oh man, would it be like bitey or weird like if I did Ableton tutorials? And you're like, no, fucking go for it. I'm glad you remember what I said because yeah, I don't remember much from that particular <laughs> event. That was um, that was when you jumped up and I think you started close to 200 BPM. I think or your set or something, right? Yeah, um, th at that time I was like super into breakcore and um, like gabber and shit like that for whatever reason. Uh, it was it was fantastic, man. I mean, you know those those um, especially in New Zealand, the smaller parties. You know, just me and Muzz. Um, if you're not familiar, Muzz is kind of was my manager for quite a long time, and I think he, you've had a bit to do with him as well in the past. Yeah, he, he managed me for like a year or something like that. Yeah, true, true. And we were just kind of standing at the back when you started, just going, this is going to be fucked. And it was great, man, like just twisted, noisy core of music. And, yeah, people people in New Zealand really 
give anything a go, you know. I think it's just like the population and if something's new there and something's good, everyone's going to give it a real good go. And it was just a cool vibe to see see you jump up there and um and do your thing. And I've got some um I've got some videos. I don't know if I've ever sent them to you, but I've actually got some videos of your set from that party in my archives, which are quite a treat to watch. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I should maybe we could put them in the uh, episode description or something. I'll have um, to go through my um my hard drive of um I call it my potential blackmail hard drive, but I've just got <laughs> you know hundred hundreds of hours of footage of being that annoying guy with the camera, like all the way from since my teenage years, which is paying off. You know, I'll pull out something at parties and people are like, oh, I'm so glad you got that. I'm like, yeah, you were calling me a fuckwit back then, but. <laughs> <laughs> and you call it your potential blackmail hard drive just like in case anyone I, fucks you over, you just have a bunch it, of shit to. <laughs> as a joke, I mean, I, I look through it occasionally and, man, there's some stuff in there like 15 years later, it's still not cooked properly. You know, if I was to, if I was to show that to the people in question or put it out there, not a good idea. But I just know, you know, even if we're, old people sitting in the home, retirement home, pull out a pull out a computer or whatever and put it on and be like, oh, yeah, look at that. We used to really, like, fuck, fuck shit up and be loose counts. So. <laughs> yeah, that's like the uh, 2020 equivalent of um, your, your dad or your mum pulling out the photo album or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents are rampant with that. Eh? I've got, oh, man, the archives or something else. But I really enjoy showing those to people. Uh, I really enjoy taking people to my parents' house. Like people such as you would be really cool or people who actually know quite a lot about me and how my brain works Um, because apparently it really sheds a lot of light on me as a person Um, and, you know, mum pulling out all the old photo albums and talking to my dad who's a psychology professor who just likes ripping the shit into anything and arguing with people that I bring over. So, um, yeah, I always quite enjoy, enjoy that experience. Oh, so your dad's a psychologist. Uh, he, he was back in the day, he was a professor of, um, psychology at the Canterbury Uni in New Zealand. And, uh, then he moved on to working with, um, working with, uh, I believe kind of children, like really extreme places, cases of abuse and neglect and, um, things, you know, things like that. Like he, he, he was kind of doing a lot of research into getting kids with, acute mutism to open up and came up with some really interesting ideas, which I believe are still used today. Things like song and using puppetry to introduce the third person between the adult and the child and all this kind of stuff. So really hard to reach kids. Um, so we did a lot of work with that, but he's always been a very inquisitive, no filtered type person, which is probably where I get that side of my personality from. And so if I bring someone over, especially someone who's you know, quite opinionated on a particular matter, whether it's politics or science or atheism or something. Um, it makes for a good dinner conversation because he doesn't hold back. <laughs> right. So you, but mum will be mum will be sitting there going, going, Rod, you know, stop. This is Tom's friend. Leave him alone. And he's like, no, no, no. So I'd love to take you over to dinner one time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Ryan's dad. So for those listening, Ryan is the other guy from Electricado, and his dad's a. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, his whole family, his mum and his dad are both South African. And um, right. <clears throat> his dad's a South African barrister for um, uh, like not criminal law, but like whatever, like workplace law, I guess, you know, like big insurance type shit. Right. And yeah, right. so he's a pretty educated dude. Um, and yeah, it's just fun to hear his opinion on shit. But yeah, it's like that mixture of well-educated and also old and not giving a fuck. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. like that perfect oh, mixture absolutely. of like that perfect mixture of like uh, pompous, like uh, you know, doesn't yeah, I don't know. And they just love to argue. I, I love old people like that. Mm-hmm. The, the other person, mm-hmm. I know a few people like that. Patrick Leonard, um, my buddy's friend, who wrote "Like a Prayer" by Madonna and like wrote a bunch of. He played keys on like the Michael Jackson thriller tour and shit like that. He's right. kind of yeah. kind of the same. He's like this older dude um, who's, you know, super fucking smart, obviously, and like knows what he's doing. But I feel like once you just get to a certain age, you just become argument. You, you kind of go one or two ways. Hey, you just become like insanely argumentative or you just go like, fuck it. Just let your nuts hang out and watch the football or something. It's it. I mean, the whole, you know, the whole cliche you know the less fucks you give kind of thing i think that does hold 
uh, you know, a bit of ground with with things. But I, f- I kind of find there's a point where one of those fucks that you give or you fail to give eventually is the fuck about giving fucks to give. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think the quicker you get to that point, like maybe maybe the better you're doing in life. I'm not, sh- I'm not yeah, sure about that one. That's just, probably just a pretty thought, but... decent measure of success right there, to be honest. Because, mm. I mean, I'm, 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 no- I'm, no- I'm noticing it a lot. I mean, how about, how about you? Like, are you, you seem yeah. a lot more, I'm not going to say, oh, maybe chill, but, you know, a little bit more content than when I first met you years ago. And I know we were, you know, kind of like a lot, we were pretty rampant and doing lots of weird abstract things and pushing the limits with a lot of different things. But, um, you know, like it's, are you finding you kind of, you know, whatever, you know, so let's say someone, you know, publicly criticizes you on a YouTube comment or something. You know, yeah, unless you but, want to engage for trolling purposes. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I'm totally. So I think as far as YouTube stuff goes, I'm like 100% comfortable with people saying whatever at this point. And I don't know if that comes from getting older or if that just comes from overexposure because it's just like I've dealt, like, I don't know, Ill Gates puts it a good way. He says, um, if you can't handle people saying mean shit to you on the internet, then the internet is no place for you to be famous, basically. Um, true true yeah i guess yeah and i think like you get to yeah all i was gonna say like um i I just think you get to a point with it where after you after you've been trolled enough times or after enough people have just said dumb shit to you on the internet eventually you're just like yeah fuck it this is the internet this is what it is like (laughs) and you just stop taking it so seriously and just realize that it is that and 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 also like uh yeah as a musician who's gotten both like, you know, semi big online and also semi big in the show circuit. Mm-hmm. I, I realize the massive dissonance, right? Like, you know, I go out and play shows to thousands of people and I put tutorials online that get viewed by thousands of people. And the only place where there's lots of people telling me who's fucked my mum recently is not at the shows. It's <laughs> <in> there, <right? laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, there's probably an interesting branch between, um, I, I mean, if you think back to when you were at the stage where, you know, you weren't, you, you were building yourself, you were building your music, um, you know, you were thriving for people to listen to it. You were one of the people that like, hey, listen to this track. I really want to get feedback, blah, blah, blah. I felt like there was a phase in my life. Um, this is probably more in person than on the internet, but where obviously any kind of feedback was really valuable, but there hadn't yet been the experience or the frequency of, let's say, unconstructive criticism or kind of tall poppy-ish type stuff to come your way for you to be able to distinguish properly between, um, you know, what is someone genuinely giving you good information on how they feel that you could better yourselves, whether you want to or not, whether you're writing music for yourself or for other people. And people, especially I've found in New Zealand, where people, you know, are just kind of like, oh, no, that was shit. Like, that was probably the worst performance that I've heard you ever heard you play. Maybe just because, you know, they feel that as you grow and as they watch you grow, that's a necessary thing in order to help keep your ego going in the right path. I don't know if that's kind of the definition of tall poppy or whatever, but it's, I, you know, it's just this kind of... I, I think tall poppy syndrome is not when somebody criticizes you because they want you to be better. I think it's when they criticize you because they're jealous of you doing a fulfilling thing. Like this, it's kind of like, um, you know, like if you see somebody, if I mean, it's hard to say, right? Because you're you're not this kind of person. You're not like this lazy fucking person who sits around doing nothing and looks at other people and and pays them out. It's a certain breed of person who does that. But mm-hmm. how I imagine it, and I've been this person before, is um, uh, I mean, I haven't been this, but I've had glimpses of what it would be like. I think to be that person, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> if you just sit around and you don't. Like you think all the time, like, oh, it'd be cool to go on a diet and lose weight or like, it'd be cool to like maybe give up alcohol or, you know, it'd be, it'd be cool to maybe start learning how to fucking write JavaScript or something like that. And you just don't do it because you, whatever reason, like, you know, you just, you just don't because you're lazy or because you have anxiety about it or. You know, for yeah, for whatever reason. A, num- then, a number of things and some which right, are right. quite valid. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah, for sure. And then you see someone who's like nailing it and, and doing a really good job at those things. It if if 
if you're that kind of person, like it can maybe just spike a response of like, well, fuck you. And like, now I want to make you feel better because you're doing the fulfilling thing. And I kind of want to bring you down to my level sort of thing. Mm. I think I that's think, just a okay. certain type of person out there who's like that. So that's um that's 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 kind of the the tall poppy definition is the is is to bring them down because they're doing something which you have failed to do for whatever reason. Um, I think at the core but, um, of it, it could be not even something that you've tried to do or want to do, but it's just the fact that 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 someone's doing something that's making them feel fulfilled, and you're not right. Right, which is usually the actual drive in the process of trying to get to the certain place. I mean, that's where the dopamine is, you know. So, you know, if, 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 if you know, yeah, I've seen people who, again, back when I started out, I tend to ignore all this shit these days, but, yeah, I definitely got people who would just try to hinder my uh, self-confidence. But I, the, I guess the tangent or the, 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 the side quest of what I was talking about there is I, I seem to find, I could be wrong here, but I, I found there were people who, um, who weren't actually usually like that, who would give opinions on music, um, usually, usually music or usually the way I conducted myself in some other way, but it would, I, I would identify it as false, which is a really risky thing to do by yourself if someone's giving you what seems like genuine constructive criticism to actually be like no I don't actually believe this I believe they're doing something else but you do learn that skill I think and this and this particular style is is it it's it's almost like because it came from people who were quite close to me or were acquaintances that I, I had seen regularly at parties before I started playing and it was like they were trying to make me not forget where my roots were to a degree or like, you know, they didn't, they didn't want me to become perhaps a, you know, a dickhead as I grew in my, uh, my fame and my music got more popular. Um, perhaps they want, you know, they thought they might be doing a slight service and keeping things a bit more real, if that makes mm. sense. Um, and, and, and yeah, anyway, I, I, I kind of very, very quickly managed to start distinguishing the difference between that and constructive criticism because constructive criticism and feedback is really valuable to me. I mean, whether I'm writing something for myself and other people like it, or I am actually writing something I would like the masses to um, enjoy, having that kind of information is just at the minimum extremely interesting to hear. Um, I had a guy once who I played two parties in New Zealand, one weekend after the other, two festivals, and I was running short on time so my set was pretty much the same, you know, bar some tweaks of knobs and stuff, but things like the order of the stems I was playing, the order of the tracks, the build-ups, um, you know, I, I might have some kind of delay effect I was playing over a synth line during a build-up, and I'd do the same thing. It would be slightly different, but it was the same set. And the first party, this person came up and said, you know, this was one of the least enjoyable they've heard and you know you know what's going on like do you need to you know take some time to yourself and rah, rah, rah. and then the next weekend when I played this set they came up and they just went oh that was just immaculately better like you just did such a good job with that one um they didn't say you know there was a kind of a tone of of what they portrayed to me for the bad set I had taken into heart and really focused on and then produced something based on that comment which I hadn't done at all. And it was just, that, that was kind of the moment where I was like, yeah, it's this really interesting um, kind of filter that you have to develop quite early. And then you start going on the internet and, you know, everyone's fucked your mum. And it's, it's, it's funny, man. I've had pretty similar experiences like that too, where, where somebody has like, where, where you, ch you change. Um, and this still happens to me, right? Like I'll send music to a friend who I know, is very good at mix downs or something, right? And they'll just be like, oh, there's way too much 5K, way too much. Or like, you know, that snare is way too loud. It's fucking piercing. And like, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll say things like in this extremely excessive way, right? Yeah. And then I'll, I'll change things just a tiny bit, like remove mm -hmm. a little bit of 5K, turn the snare down by like a decibel, send it back and they'll be like, that's way better. <laughs> and it's just sometimes like these very small tweaks to some people, right, can can mean a world of difference on the other side. I'm not saying that that's what the case was with this particular guy that you're talking about, um, mm. but I've had that experience too. And I've also had, had the experience you're talking about where you literally can show someone something twice and they can have two different experiences with it internally themselves on two different occasions. But, but there's, yeah, there's I, also, 
Also, you know, environmental factors, which include what particular drugs they're on when they're listening to them, you know, things like that. I mean, that guy could have been on a four-day bender and he was coming down while he was listening to it. And then the next weekend, you know, he could have just like popped a couple of pills and listened to it, you know, so, you know, there's all that as well. Right. No one, yeah, no one's written a book um, about this shit. No one's written a book about this shit, you know, there needs to be a manual. <laughs> we we got to learn right. this stuff by ourselves. It's a hard life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I don't think it's that uh, useful to, I mean, it depends whose comment you're taking, right? But it's it's sort of like some guy at a party who's clearly fucking been awake for days on end. It's, I'm not sure how valuable their opinion is. Uh, whereas it's like if, if it's your favorite artist ever, like, I don't know, Boris Brescher or Tipper or something like that, giving mm. you criticism, I think, you know, you can maybe put a little bit more weight on that. But that's the thing is like, I kind of look at most people commenting on youtube um especially if they're commenting something negative as mm -hmm. as some something like that like just some weird and I, and I don't want to discredit people from commenting on my youtube videos it's not like i actively read these comments being like all these people are pieces of shit but like mm -hmm. i definitely especially if someone's saying something negative just view them as like someone whose opinion i just do not give a shit about at all mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you've got the statistics behind you to say you are going and I mean, you're going in a very sure and steady direction. And I'm assuming it's the one that you want, or one of the ones that you want. Um, so, you know, when you do get those ones, um, I think it's okay to, to, to dismiss them. But I mean, if you know, there's still, there's still situations where someone might um, bring up something which I think is actually quite valid and actually spend a lot of time thinking about it. And yeah, it's, I mean, my, I, I'm quite lucky and I think you would be too. You, your fan base seems to be a bit more, I don't know what the word is. You have a word for what your fan base is, if you could give it a kind of a genre or a name or a flavor. Uh, I'd say it's pretty similar to yours um, in the sense that it's a lot of producers, but I would mm -hmm. say that um, there's also it's starting to slowly become a somewhat bass music community driven uh, fan base. Um, but, but it also started out not that way. It started out as very much producers and IDM people. And I think it just really I, I, depends on like what you're doing as to like what kind of fan base you'll foster. Right. I think, um, I, I think what I'm kind of getting at is, you know, from your discord and from your YouTube's comments. And I think it reflects on you being a very incredibly open, unfiltered person I think there's a lot more, um, a lot more sarcasm, a lot more uh, kind of uh, you know, boisterous kind of behavior and meme culture and stuff that people tend to, you know, like some. I think I joined your server last, and everyone had renamed their names to Bill or something, or uh, or so, something like that. It was just, I, was, I think it's, I think it's great, um, but I don't get, I don't get too many comments on my content where people are kind of, you know, taking the piss. And if they are, it's like, you know, really clearly over the top. Um, I don't know whether I like it or not. I just, I just notice a slight, a slight, a slight difference in that. Um, right. cause I, 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 Hey, here's a question. So do you, do you listen to your tracks on SoundCloud and follow the comments as you're listening quite often? Uh, I used to, I haven't done that in a while. Usually what I'll do these days, uh, is I'll put a release out and then maybe like a month down the track, I'll click on it and have a look at some comments. Same with YouTube. I try not to look at them too much. I mean, I, I'm not like completely absolved from ego, obviously. Like I, I do look at my comments, but not, mm. not like I used to for sure. Gotcha. I, it's, it's one of my favorite pastimes is, is going through, <clears throat> excuse me, old tracks and just reading the comments as people have left them on the track. And obviously people are just like, oh, wow, fucking cool. You know, there's those ones and they're cool. But, you know, there's people who kind of just a little hidden gem where somebody will mention something about a thing that I spent a lot of work on that I didn't think anyone picked up on. And it's actually, you know, I really still quite enjoy that. You know, I mean, listening to my music over and over as, you know, it's not something I do all the time because I've already heard it heaps, but I just find that really enjoyable and I'm wondering if other producers do it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely listen to my music a lot, especially my whips. Like I have a giant whips folder that's like hundreds of tunes and I constantly listen to it. Like every day I'll go in there and listen to something from it basically because I'm constantly trying to, you know, just listen through it, 
slowly figure out what it is I like about all these songs and what it is I don't like about all these songs. And then one day I'll mm-hmm. just be like, oh, fuck, I've got to work on that again right now. And then I'll work on it and slowly you know, chip Absolutely. away at this. It's like this huge body of work, like hundreds of songs that I'm just slowly chipping away at. And every now and then an album will fall out of it sort of thing. Definitely, definitely. I, I'm definitely at that that stage as well. I think <clears throat> I went through, I mean, I've, I've probably got about 30 or 40 whips in my um, project folder, but I've got, you know, a good seven, eight or nine, which are probably between 50 to 80% completion. Um, and just kind of recently went, this would be a really nice album you know um yeah that's how that's how you do it i reckon is you just sort of work and work and work and then eventually you're just like oh shit there's an album sitting here that's pretty cool and then i've put that in its own separate folder find all the project files put those in their own separate folder and then just sort of compartmentalize it from the rest of your sort of larger just random work folder or whatever and i think it's something you might have shown me a few years back is there's stuff sitting in there which yeah, I know I'm never going to finish, but there was, there had to have been one or two really good ideas in there. Um, just go in them, go in there, render them out as a wave, and chuck them in there as a wave file. Like you know, nuke the rest of it, or not nuke the rest of it, archive the rest of it, and just have that, and then be like, oh, I can probably drop this into here, you know, and boom, that's kind of the missing piece of a puzzle. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it's um, I did that with Apophenia. There's a bunch of songs on that album called like Composite Four and Composite Eleven and stuff like that. And all of the tracks that are named that way is because they're just composites of like many other files. So there's like um, you know, there'll be like there would have been like four or five whips that I had in a folder somewhere that were just all in the key of F or whatever, and mm-hmm. all had like a somewhat similar vibe. And then I would just drag mm-hmm. all the ALSs into another Ableton file and then just sort of compile them all into a song it's like a big frankenstein type thing yeah and it was kind of interesting because like um the skill of making the song became different it no longer became about like well what do i do next and like how do i weave you know these melodies with this bass line it just became simply like how do i make all of these songs fit together sort of like a mini mix but like really heavily produced Mm. and i think um for us and us you know some other producers who uh, you know, I mean, I think we have a slightly similar style in the sense that we do tend to change, you know, mid-track quite often. I mean, mm. I, my mind stems out of just, I, I don't even know, but, you know, I, I like to have at least three genres in a track. <laughs> so right. it kind of works out for the best in that kind of sense. Yeah, I mean, it probably comes from, like, just listening to DJ sets a lot too, right? And then being like, oh, that, that would be cool to just produce these little DJ sets into tracks essentially. Absolutely. You kind of get that in uh, dubstep songs these days a lot. So there's in literally every dubstep song of the last few years, um, drops always have what's called a switch where it's like Mm -hmm. 16 bars of one drop and then it literally just kind of changes and and there's like a almost a second drop in it's like related obviously to the first one, but it's it's almost like very different. And then the second drop is kind of the same so it's like per song you get like four drops sort of thing with these switches yeah i, and I like line. that i like that kind of stuff i think that's yeah, really me too cool. i mean I, I think it's refreshing on the ear because it instantly engages your ear to be like oh fuck there's a lot of different shit going on it just doesn't become gray because there's a lot of contrast right and contrast is super important in music mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. <clears throat> um yeah i think it's i think it's a fine thing to do for sure uh i wanted to t- to, to go back uh, there's one more thing i wanted to ask um uh, when mm-hmm. we're talking about the people's opinions on things and that's that you do a lot of software stuff and i think um people's opinions in that world is like completely different to people's opinions in the music world right because in the music world it's all subjective and it's like you know one person might not like a distorted kick drum and another person might think it's the the start of a new genre whereas in software it's like your shit either works on someone's computer or it doesn't sorry repeat that last sentence I was saying it's in, in software, it's it's like your your software either works or it does not. And true, therefore, true. it's like your opinion. It's like not even really opinionated at that point, right? So you kind of have to filter through everyone's thoughts and uh, messages in, in regards to the software that you make. And that can be like a completely frustrating and crazy thing to do, right? It can. And I mean, we, we've talked about this before as well as, you know, I mean, I mean, I obviously need some kind of like user experience person to oversee the things that I put out there. Um, Cause 
Yeah, I, I I do tend to. I mean, I have a bit of a problem with starting things and like making the shiny parts and then kind of being like, here you go, here's like some nice raw kind of utility to play with, but um, no real intuition in how it can be used in various different creative ways. Um, so yeah, it's tough with software, man. It's it's yeah. The thing is with with software, it's a lot of it's not glamorous for sure. Um, but it's just yeah, it seems you know, like your purposes and how you write a song, for instance, leakage, right? It's like, it's a very yeah. specific thing to your workflow and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I, I just could not understand it at all. And yeah. couldn't like seem yeah. to get it working with stuff. Yeah. And you, but you gave some really, you know, valuable feedback, um, which, you know, I, I listened to and I think is really, really, really interesting, which, you know, to sum it all up for people listening was to, you know, get rid of the majority of the actual parameters that you can control and just have kind of little random mutate buttons and, and stuff like that, you know, and just so I don't, I mean, that adds to the excitement of someone just opening it up and being able to just like get results straight away rather than having to learn something like an instrument. Yeah. I, I definitely want to revisit that when I, when I've got time. Um, so, well, I mean, what I've been doing um, a lot of, you know, recently is, is making software, making Mac stuff, for people as you know co kind of contract jobs and having very specific visions from that person not necessarily instructions on how they want it to be and what functions they want to have but you know it's for a particular person who has a particular thing that they want to achieve and i'm finding that a lot uh, quite enjoyable because i don't have to worry too much about the user experience in part of things because I know what they want to have control over ultimately in the end. And this is just for an, an individual. Um, but when I'm doing something like really broad, like leakage or something, um, well, for example, the, um, the downgrade pack, which I put out, which was, I believe four, five, six, seven, eight, can't remember, um, just racks for Ableton live that pretty much consisted only of native Ableton audio effects, but did things to, very lo-fi hip-hop kind of stuff, you know, that would have a bit of a uh, kind of a tape wobble and then add some noise in different ways and just some band restrictions with EQs to make it sound like an old radio and crackles and all that kind of stuff. I made sure that, you know, all of the devices were hidden and there were just the eight macro knobs. And that is by far the most <clears throat> popular thing that um, I've put out as, you know, people being like, oh, this is awesome, I can use this. And, you know, that just made total sense. It's like, you know, I don't need to give people, you know, like what kind of, how many millisecond range do you want the randomness to sway and what frequency do you want it to sway up and down? You know, it's just like here is a sway knob, you know, things like that. Right. It's kind of like when you open up a plugin, like, I don't know, <clears throat> a sound goodizer, right, in Fruity Loops. It's literally mm. just one big knob that you turn up or down and it just makes your shit sound fatter or less fat. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's the daddy of it, right? That's uh... <laughs> right, right, right. And, and it's like, obviously it's doing more like as you're turning it up, it's, you know, uh, removing certain, you know, nasal mid frequencies, boosting bass, boosting highs, adding compression, probably adding a bit of like soft clipping saturation. Like it's doing a lot of stuff as you turn that mm -hmm. knob up, but mm -hmm. from the end user experience, like you don't give a shit. You just put it on and turn it off. Like you don't need to know like exactly what saturation algorithm is working in there and stuff like that. And as far as, um, kind of from a, you know, education perspective, you know, stuff like that's really, really good. I mean, like what I've found, uh, you know, over the years is, you know, when you're starting off, if you're starting a new course or starting a new series or something, you know, if you can get excitement straight away, cause you know, there's a whole bunch of boring shit people have to learn. But if you can get these excitement checkpoints along the way, it just drives people to just power through the boring shit. You know, if you can put a sound good eyes on something and just make whatever people are doing sounding really fat straight away, you know, they're more likely to, you know, play with their, you know, drum loop for an extra half an hour or something, you know. Um, I think it's like a really, if you can carefully craft kind of checkpoints where people are just like, whoa, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Here's a knob that does cool shit to what I've already done. I think you're onto a bit of a winner as far as like keeping people retained. I think. I oh, know for sure. I'm working, working on something. Working on something at the moment with that. So. Yeah. Nice. Uh, no, I totally agree. I um, had that experience when I was teaching at Berkeley. I was mm -hmm. teaching two classes, 
and one was this like masters of sound design class which is they were like all pretty knowledgeable people Mm -hmm. um and then the other one was like a essentially a business students class who were doing a business degree at berkeley but also needed to take some more electives or whatever to to make their degree happen um gotcha. and so i was teaching a bunch of business students how to use ableton and i'd sort of just like you know rattle off how you put a beat together i'd be like all right so you know you put a kick in in the sampler but if you want to make your own kick here's how you do it and show them how to do it really quickly and then be like and then you know we need like a baseline so i'd you know show them how to load up a, a device and you know load midi up and and then you know talk about a quick overview of bass synthesis and then and but the thing is is like talking about it's like way too much shit like essentially what i found i needed to do for anybody to retain anything was basically just be like here's how to load a bunch of presets up and play stuff in Mm -hmm. on a keyboard totally totally i kind of done um a bit of uh, a handful of um kind of workshops for i did some for headspace which is a uh i believe government funded kind of music school for meditation app isn't it I, they have their own meditation app, but they kind of they have um, kind of maybe like youth education centres around Australia where um, they get kind of kind of teens in and stuff. Um, I'm not sure if it's you know people who need a bit of direction or whatever, but I've gone on gone in there and it's kind of you know maybe 13 to 17 is the age range, and it's usually uh, male. Um, and the best thing to do is just be like, here are 16 drum pads, here is a mic, and then you know one guy will sit down and just like make a beat. The other guy will start, you know, vibing. You'll see somebody who's like into like making wub wub wubs. And next thing you know, like they're making a dubstep track and then, then you can start breaking it down as to what's happening. But that's, you know, give a bunch of 16 year old boys some pads and a microphone with some drum kits and yeah, you're sorted. (laughs) Right. So the thing that you were alluding to that you're making is um, I'm assuming if I were to take a guess, some sort of max device that kind of shows people basic things and walks them through the process of learning something are you talking about what i just mentioned before is in um my, yeah you said you were working on something in relation to this concept oh well well what happened is um i made a template for uh someone who is a very hands-on person uh they've got a mic they've got a synth um they just want to record loops um, they don't have any means to make any kind of drum beats and stuff. So I just loaded up a whole bunch of different drum beats, um, a few different kind of atmospheric pad sounds, <clears throat> set up some tracks, kind of six audio tracks, which were easy to just arm and input stuff coming from your external devices. And on each track just had a really, I made a really basic rack, which you could just cycle through uh, delay, reverb, um, you know, some auto filter type stuff. And it just it took me about an hour and they I, I went over and have seen what they've done with it and they've written eight tracks with it they have no idea how to get the, the session loops into arrangement view which is obviously the next logical step but i'm going there's, there's really something going on here and so i'm kind of um um I've, I've crafted this i really i still really like the challenge thing i know you've done some stuff recently with you know setting people challenges but um these particular challenges is it's kind of a 14 day thing and each one is maybe 10 to 20 minutes and you actually kind of build your own template on how you want to work so the first one is like here here are a bunch of pre-made samples in session view and you just click play and you just make your own combination of them and you know the challenge is to make you know one kind of cool loop out of let's say 10 of each kick snare pad synth bass samples and then from there it's like oh okay let's record those into arrangement view or let's start playing with really basic effects so each one kind of moves you forward and it lets you kind of save what you consider to be a cool thing that you have found and then by the end of the 14 days you've sort of got this session view template which is very specifically designed for how you would like to work um for jamming and yeah of of course the secondary big component is moving that into arrangement view kind of recording from session view and then kind of moving things around phasing uh phrasing drops transitions progression and that sort of thing and i think um yeah i think i think it's going to be pretty cool eh? there it's all down in text at the moment Um, i'm a little bit too busy at the moment with other stuff to 
to produce it, but I reckon within the next month, it's going to be the next thing I put out as far as an educational resource goes. Oh cool. yeah, this episode will probably come out <clears throat> right around the same time then. What, what's um, that? This episode will probably come out just around the same time, I, I reckon. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, that'll be great. <clears throat> well, um, um, let me make up a URL. <laughs> um, no, you just Google Google my name. You'll, you'll find it. Uh, so is it using Mac stuff or is it just going to be Ableton stuff? If, if it does use Mac stuff, it will be very simple things like um, setting people timers. So just having a little pop-up timer saying, okay, you've got 10 minutes to try and do this. Um, you know, put a little bit of pressure on. I find a little bit of pressure helps people kind of, you know, stop spending 20 minutes, you know, getting the space of this near in the spectrum kind of right, things like that. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll use too many Max things. The one Max thing that I thought about doing, and I've actually talked to a few people about this, is so say, let, let's say you've made a loop, whether it's in arrangement view or session view, let's say you've made your 16 bar loop. I mean, that's what I tend to do. I tend to go to bar 32 or 64 and then make like a nice full loop and then go backwards to make kind of the intro leading up to it and then forwards. But when you've got that kind of 16 bar loop or 32 bar loop, which is kind of the substance of your track, it would be really cool to have a max for live device that kind of pops up and you've kind of got, I don't know, let's say like an eight by 64 grid of buttons or slots where you can kind of like drag the loops that you've made and make your progression in a very basic kind of overview of arrangement views. So, you know, like you could just leave two slots out for when there's a breakdown and put them back again and you click a button and it kind of like populates your entire arrangement view with the loops that you've done. And then obviously there's a lot of blanks that you'd have to fill in, but I think it would be people seem to get really stuck on that point of wanting to expand their loop out and adding progression to their track. And I find a lot of whips tend to just be, you know, 32 bar loops that haven't got any progression, but you know, I, I just, I find when I make that 32 bar loop, and even if I just have white noise building up and then a quick Tom roll and a crash dropping into that, instantly I'm excited again. I want to start working on the progression <laughs> and I, I kind of, I kind of want to just have something that will help people get that get that feeling straight away without being like oh fuck what do i do now you know yeah i find i got stuck for a few reasons one one of which is um once i make that 32 bar loop or whatever i want to make it sound as good as it possibly can so i'll get mm -hmm. i'll just spend like an hour or something just cleaning it up and just adding little bits and pieces to it until it sounds super polished and then it's by yeah. that point i've sort of lost the mental space that i was in to make the loop in the first place um, totally. whereas if I found, if I, I find that if I just don't care too much about that shit at first, I just like as fast as I can sort of build the loop out into a song, um, the song will sound like shit and there'll be like no transitions and or anything like that, but at least it'll mm. have some sort of like linear progression that sort of makes sense melodically and musically. And then from there I can kind of adjust. And I, I found that that's been the, the only way that I seem to be able to get songs finished. Cause it, it's like. I've noticed recently, it's almost like if I start a song and I write, you know, even two minutes of it and then go like, ah, oh, it's pretty good. Yeah. I'll stop there for today and come back to that another time. It always just sits there for like a year, <laughs> just in that two minute state. Um, just because I find it hard to get back to the the mental place again of, of where I was when I started it. I, d I definitely noticed that. Eh? And that's why... Um if I'm on a roll. So I, I haven't actually been producing much over the last couple of years, like um, not through lack of enjoyment of writing music, just because of the really cool opportunities I've had to work with other people. But just recently I've been doing it again. And I find if I'm on a roll, I just, I just don't stop. Eh? I fight through sleep depth. Um, I cancel everything else because, you know, it's just so hard for me to get back into that zone you know i need a good couple of hours of being really excited and then it's just flowing and the idea of just like oh i better go to sleep now and you're just stopping that completely and when you wake up in the morning you've got to restart everything and all that stuff again so yeah i try to i try to roll as long as i possibly can until the ideas are just sucking completely or i'm falling asleep in my chair it's cool that you um that you recognize like how important it is to juice that vibe once you're on it because i find mm. i'm pretty fucking bad at being like yeah i'm right in the zone right now and then something else will just come up and i'll be like ah oh, fuck it i'll just come back later and <laughs> make music then but yeah it's 
it is kind of important i think i don't know if i'd go as far to just not sleep or anything but um but yeah i definitely realized well, i mean the I, I wouldn't like i wouldn't like stay for three days straight i mean there there is a point where i notice my sleep deprivation does start interfering with the creative process and that's when i start doing I, I find i start doing little things like little fills and little glitches and little tweaks like i don't actually do any kind of like levels of sound design stuff i just i just use my little extra energy to add some phrasing and add some um progression into things and then that's usually when i'm like okay no more good ideas are coming here mm. and i will uh i'll call it quits at this point um and you can see most most of those when i do kind of like 9 10 11 12 hour live streams you'll see near the end of them you know like i'm um, anything i try to do which is kind of creative is uh you know pretty pretty not good <laughs> <laughs> damn 12 hour yeah. live streams that's a brutal i did an eight hour one the other day on um the adsr youtube channel basically they hit me oh, yeah? up <laughs> yeah so they hit me up and they were like we'd like to get uh they, they messaged my management email which is just my email but my manager also has access to it mm -hmm. um and they're like we would like to get mr bill to do a stream on the youtube channel uh we can pay 125 bucks an hour <laughs> and oh fuck you yeah, yeah we'll, we'll <laughs> give like, them my uh, give them my uh give them my details man Look. right yeah <laughs> well i was just like cool how long can i stream for and they're like oh as long as you want and i was like uh oh, cool i'll do a 24-hour stream then i guess if you're paying me 125 bucks an hour um and they were like oh let, yeah. they're like let's uh cap it at eight so <laughs> yeah that's still, i mean that's still good though yeah it's still good i mean i had a fun time and it seemed like people were engaged but um yeah, I've I've always wanted to do a twenty four hour one. I've never done it yet, but I think that would be the next logical step. The thing I the thing I've got to watch with those though is, um, <clears throat> you know, after a while, you know, because th there is quite a lot of um, administrative boring stuff. I think I was listening to you and Slink in the last couple of. Oh, whenever you did that podcast and you're talking about, you know, there's a lot of boring shit that you don't want to do on stream, um, you know, and it's not that interesting. But you know, I tend to do it anyway. And that's when I start just kind of interacting with the chat a bit and talking about life stories and things and whatever they whatever comes up. And I think that's when you've got to kind of start watching your sentences because someone can just clip it and it can go out of context, and you're a little bit sleep deprived and uh, you know not watching what you're saying. Well, people so, can um, sort of do that shit anyway. I mean, it's uh, at this point like you know somebody like you or I has enough of our voice online that. Um, I think it's pretty easy now to build a profile of someone's voice and and just type sentences into a text box and hit enter and it spits it out. Have you heard of liar? Ah, just go for it. Have you heard of <laughs> go for it? I say liarbird dot dot ai or whatever it's called. Have you, have you used that? Uh, I, it rings a bell. Um, so it's just a web app. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's a web app that say that just uh, gives you text sentences. And it just gets you to say all the text sentences into the web app. And then eventually after you've said all of them, um, it's built up enough of a profile that you can just type whatever in and hit go and it <laughs> spits it out in your voice. Oh man. I mean, then you just need that like software that can, you know, convert everything that you've ever said online into a kind of a directory that kind of understands how you think and what your answers would be. And then you can just do podcasts with people and they don't have to be there. <laughs> Oh, I don't have to be there. No, oh, you, you and me don't have to be there. We could just be like the Bill, and <laughs> Mr. Bill, and Tom Cosman podcast, and we just sit it away, and then boom, it's like exactly what we'd talk about anyway. For all people know, we've done that for this podcast, and that's what they're listening to right now, and and they'll never know the difference as to whether or not we ever had this conversation. We have to be careful though, because I haven't been programmed with very good stack overflow protection. So the more meta <laughs> we get, the more likely this is to crash. That's a good point. Yeah, <clears> let's <laughs> we should uh, stop going down this rabbit hole so we don't crash ourselves. Um, <laughs> so I, I learned about stack overflow the other day um, and it basically seems like fucking the most pretentious place ever um, other than... You're talking about the website? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. What are you, what are you doing to, uh, to find yourself in that place? Uh, just dating yarn, which is, so she's, <laughs> she's always on there. I, I understand. I understand. Yeah. But so, so actually I think I found a more pretentious community than stack overflow and that is the home brewing community. I started recently getting into, um, like wanting to brew beer and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, bought a bunch of shit to brew beer basically which is i'm super excited about 
Yeah, um, cool. And I, I pretty much realized that the home brewing community is like stack overflow if everyone was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. I like it. Hey, have you talked to Muzz about that? About Stack Brewing. Overflow? Oh, no, I haven't actually. No. Yeah, that's right. He's a brewer, isn't he? Or he runs a beer Dude, company. Dude, he, he would love to talk to you. I mean, straight away, I can tell you he's going to be like, right, here's what we're going to do. Mr. Bill, brand of beer, release <laughs> October this year. Uh, here's three options. What's your address? I'm going to send you a whole bunch of uh, straight away. But, um, you know, he's so passionate about beer. And he's not that I drink beer, but he's, you know, sounds like he's really fucking good at it. Yeah, I mean, I know he did the delicious stuff and uh, Caleb did a bunch of the branding and, <clears throat> yeah, mm-hmm. Muzz, is, Muzz is a hustler for sure. Speaking of which, um, let's talk about that. You used to be fairly into drinking and then you stopped. Um, and I'm sort of, I feel like, going down the same route a little bit, to be honest. I've been massively mm-hmm. into drinking for the last few years. And yep. uh, so far this year, I think, fuck, what, how many months have we been in? Five, five or five and a half? Out of that, I've... Four. Four months. No. Oh, you mean the isolation type stuff, or I don't know, just how many months have happened this year? I guess five. Um, oh yeah. And out of that, I probably <sighs> drank for maybe one of those months, which is for me crazy. Like usually, I was in 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 succession, or like out. Uh, what well, do you mean? I did three months in succession, and then I'm currently at like in one month again, or something like that. And it, and it's not even really like I'm trying to not drink at this point. It's just sort of like I just don't really feel like it. Mm. And I don't know if that's because I'm inside all the time and don't have a lot of reason to drink to like lubricate myself for social situations or anything. But um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I just don't haven't been feeling the urge to get hammered as much as I used to. Well, it seems like, um, you know, if you subtract the kind of the social lubricant element out of it, um, from what I've seen and slightly experienced, you know, people drink for heaps of different reasons. And heaps of different reasons. Like it's really, really personal for each person. So yeah, maybe the um, maybe something in your environment's changed where it's not working out for you. I mean, the other killer is you know as you get older, hangovers stop being headaches and they turn into like full-on panic attacks and thinking you're going to die and things like that. So you know that was a big one for me. I don't know if you've reached that stage yet. <laughs> uh, kind of. I mean, I've so I've had a few things. Right. This is obviously the the sort of what I guess you call the DTS, the death trembles. Um, where the next, yeah, have you never had that? And the next day after a big night of drinking, you're shaky, like very shaky. Uh, well, what I got, what, so, you know, hypnagogic jerks. Yeah. So it's like where you, the hypnagogic state is the one just before you go to sleep, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think most people can relate to it. The feeling of falling when you fall, you know, you're going to sleep and then you suddenly wake up with a shock. It's like an electric shock or um sometimes it's accompanied with sound like a bang um mm. i think it's exploding head syndrome or whatever yeah, yeah. um it's something that i've i've had quite quite bad all my life i say bad but it's not like too bad but it started happening to me during the daytime when i wasn't sleepy hmm. um and after a while i found out that it was happening especially after i'd been drinking the night before <clears throat> and i'd be on a, i'd be on a tram or something and it's it is it is usually accompanied by um, a sound that I can best describe it as someone hitting a giant gong fed through a bit reductor re- reduction plugin. So it's really terrible metallic digital white noise, and it's quite shocking. And it it it, it, it you know it makes me stop for kind of five seconds or so. I kind of I lose my my perception of reality for a second, hmm. and. Um, not so much these days, but when it was happening and I didn't know what was going on, that would usually really set a tone for quite a while because I would be quite uncomfortable with what just happened and, it, you know, it would be quite anxiety-inducing. Um, and I actually went to see a few doctors about it because I was like, oh, what's going on with my brain, man? And, yeah, they were just saying, oh, it's this, you know, hypnagogic jerk thing. Some people just get it more so than others. Um, and, you know, it's not going to kill you and it can be quite comical. Um, but it, when I stopped drinking, they went away. So I, the, the, the tremor thing for sure, but it was these things that, that were really, really getting me. Like I, there was one time when I was after a heavy drinking session where I had one that took me so far kind of, you know, disassociated from what was going on that when I came back, 
I was just, there were, it's probably the only panic attack I think I've ever had. And, you know, if I had the ability to call an ambulance, I would have, I was I thought I was going to die. And that was the day I was like, right, I'm going to go and find out what these things are. And, um, yeah, fortunately they've, they've completely stopped, um, with the drinking. Nice. Yeah. Just good. I, I mean, not completely. I get them occasionally. So if you're ever with me in person and like I suddenly just lose the plot and I'm just staring at you and looking around like I've just done nitrous or something, um, that's probably what it is. And you're welcome <laughs> to laugh. All right. Yeah, I, I've had, I uh, used to have a shitload of panic attacks actually, like when I was younger and mm-hmm. it had a lot to do with smoking weed and drinking lots of coffee and not sleeping properly and having a shitty mm. diet and never doing exercise. Um, and I found yeah. like sort of when I adjusted all those things, um, the panic attacks kind of went away it's just like i mean yeah that, exercise when you is put, a huge one for sure totally i mean you know exercise has the splash damage of you know you know i shouldn't have a coffee right now i'm about to go for a jog or you know uh you know oh, i've got to exercise tomorrow i better not you know like stay up all night you know I and mean, that's that, that kind of exercise seems to be a pretty good solution to sorting out all those little things and what you just described as a package sounds like an anxiety attack you know it's like the anxiety attack starters kit right there <laughs> yeah pretty much that was like just my lifestyle from fucking i don't know 17 until 23 or something like that it was just like heinous yeah. amounts of like smoking like 50 cones a day and eating nothing but mm. hungry jacks which is uh if anyone's not from australia that is australian burger king and, uh, totally, totally. <clears throat> so apparently yeah. the reason why that's the case is because um somebody already owned the rights to burger king in australia and then when they tried to launch in australia they're like oh sorry we can't do it some guy in south australia has already bought that name here so um Again, smart guy <laughs> <laughs> well he didn't yeah i mean uh, this is a long time ago i think so instead they they launched in australia as hungry jacks with just a complete new branding so yeah, and there's and it's not even the mm. same menu, which is funny to me. It's like they didn't even f- fucking why wouldn't they just keep everything the same but just change the name to like Burger Kang or something like that? <laughs> it, well, what's what would be the uh, Oka or the Australian abbreviation of Burger King? Like what like Bur- we do with Meccas? Like Burgie Burgie Chief or something. <laughs> Burgie Burgie King. I can't I can't do it. I'm not Aussie. <laughs> fucking Burgie um, Chief. <laughs> So back to the drinking thing, are you, you've, you've been thinking about what, like uh, cutting down or getting rid of it or? Um, so I'm at the point now where I'm just not drinking really, like just mm-hmm. at all really. And uh, I am instead um, have decided that I'm only going to drink beer that I brew myself, which is inherently going to put a limiter on me hard because I can only brew mm-hmm. so much beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also just a lot of fucking work. Like I, I'm going to really, you know, have to work for the beer now. So, um, I think, I think that sounds pretty positive. I mean, you know, you're like kind of having a drink as the giving yourself a reward for like, you know, experiencing the creation that you've, you've come up with. And- yeah, exactly. And I, and I, I feel like I'm right at the point now where it's sort of like, um, so for instance, right. Like I, I just uh, explained to you, like how I was having panic attacks and, a lot of it seemed weed related when I was mm-hmm. like 20, right? But the yep. thing is, is if I had have just stopped smoking weed like a year earlier and just like instead curbed my habit, I probably could have had a pretty healthy relationship with weed throughout my life. But instead mm. I just busted the receptors in my brain that accept THC or whatever and just fucked them. And now I just can't really smoke weed. Um, well, there's definitely, you definitely hit a point, eh? I mean, I, I yeah, I'll, I'll say from personal experience and from what I, I've seen other people have it's it's very suddenly becomes quite a terrifying experience like it was you know a pretty common practice for me as well in my early 20s and and then probably over the period of two or three weeks it just went from fun to terrifying mm-hmm. like it it um you know, terrifying to the point where i'm like i'm never gonna touch that again right um which is a which is a lie because probably um what country am I in? Australia? Oh, whatever. It's like, it's, you know, I'll still try it, you know, maybe once or twice a year at the moment. And it's always by myself. I don't like doing it in social situations and I'll do it and I'll listen to music and I'll just, you know, I've had all positive experiences. I probably gave myself like a 10 year break because it, it was actually that terrifying. I'm like, I never want that again. But I mm-hmm. think like as a more of a mature adult, um, 
And, and, and I do notice sometimes if I do it, I can feel all of these responsibilities and things that I should have taken care of starting to sneak in. But a lot of the mindfulness um, stuff that I've done, especially with the quitting drinking and you know, my current practice, you know, I can kind of see them coming and being like, oh, hello, and kind of kind of let them pass and maybe even have a little bit of fun with the ideas as they dance around trying to get into my brain. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, <clears throat> um, so, so going back to what I was saying, I feel like I'm sort of right on the precipice of that same problem with drinking, right? Like you said, you drank up mm-hmm. to the point where it started to become terrifying. I think I'm like right before that point, and that's why I want to curb it now because I don't want to lose the ability to drink and enjoy it because it's something I really good. enjoy, right? So oh, good on you. Yeah, so I want to do it for that reason, but also, um, yeah, I just don't think it's serving me that well anymore. But but uh, to 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 talk to what you said about like um, your current practice, which I assume you're talking about meditating. Um, mm-hmm. So I started, yeah, you, you told me to start doing the Sam Harris meditation stuff. And I'm, I was already a big fan of Sam and listening to his podcast and stuff for a long time. Right. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I've, I've found the meditation stuff super beneficial to the point now where actually in the last, and this could also be another reason why I'm not really drinking is because I actually did start smoking weed again, like um, after a 10 year break as well, basically. Right. Uh, probably like a couple of months ago or something. And I'm, I'm mostly, I'm smoking pretty weak weed. Like it's one to one THC CBD sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've, yeah, I've found it just hasn't fucked with me mentally or anything. Uh, And this is kind of corresponds to when you started practicing meditation. uh, Do you think it it correlates? You think it correlates to that? Um, you know, it really just correlates to the fact that Jan brought a PAX pen here and it's just been here, <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think um, there's been a few times where I could feel myself like potentially going down that anxiety hole and having some form of ability to to be aware of my feelings and, and mm. just treat everything as something that is just a tinge of consciousness um, mm-hmm. to to be able to sort of curb it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love, I love watching feelings, feelings come in. I mean, the first, the, the first experience I had with mindfulness is in actually doing it. Cause you know, I, I, I was a bit of an eye roller and I think everybody is to a certain degree, especially, you know, with words like meditation and stuff um, was when I decided to uh, quit drinking. Um, and I, you know, I was at a stage where, it wasn't severely impacting my life in a negative way. And there was a, pro- a lot of cons as well, such as social lubricant and, you know, kind of nulling my introvertism when I went out and stuff like that. But, you know, I could definitely see it becoming like a, a, a negative part of my life. And I went um, I went to see a woman. Um, is there really, I'll, I'll start from the start. I went to the Lifeline website, right? So Lifeline in Australia is... Uh, kind of a helpline if you are distressed mentally or someone around you is mentally distressed and you can call them up and anonymously chat with someone and I was drunk and I was watching television and there was an ad saying they had a new anonymous web chat thing and just being a geek I was only interested in how they'd implemented the web chat and I went there and was just like oh thing popped up and they're like oh hello what's up and I was like oh um so it was just like I'm drunk and probably drinking a little bit too much and man, they just got me, man. They got me talking. And the next thing I know, they'd um, teamed me up with this uh, company, which kind of matches you with a therapist or a psychologist or whatever level of help you need. And um, yeah, they're like, hey, there's this woman who's close by and, you know, she's uh, really technical and scientific, but she's also done a lot of work with mindfulness. And yeah, I just went along and she was just, perfect you know she 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 got me into doing some very basic mindfulness stuff um you know the living in the present kind of thing which you know everyone always hears about but when you actually do it you kind of like huh and the reason we did that was um it's called urge surfing where you know if there is a desire to drink for whatever reason you can kind of just get yourself into the present and observe what those urges feel like as they come and at the start, you kind of see what they do to you until they actually take over and you get the urge and you drink or whatever. But, you know, after a bit of a while, you can kind of let them come in and see their behavior and what they want. And eventually, 
kind of, you know, shovel them off and say, off you go. And that was my very first um, experience with mindfulness. And it, um, I, I have actually used that quite a lot with other things in my life, whether it comes to being angry or generally anxious or just all kinds of dumb things. Like um, I get quite overwhelmed with choice when I'm shopping. So if I'm buying toilet paper, I'm like, oh, fuck, there's like 50 brands of toilet paper and it's all doing one thing. What do I do? It's just like, oh, just chill out. I'll get that one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> shit like that. So that was my first experience with it. And, um, it, yeah, really significantly helped with the drinking side of things. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's funny because I've actually noticed that basically a similar mindset has kind of coincided with with not drinking as much as well. And I haven't done it through – that definitely hasn't been a very conscious thing, um, which is funny because like mindfulness is like the most conscious thing. Um, mm. <clears throat> but, yeah, I think I kind of inherently started to do that maybe like a year ago or something because I was going through like a bunch of – bullshit in a relationship and I was constantly feeling angry mm-hmm. or uh, mainly I was just feeling like angry and trapped I think in the relationship and um, mm-hmm. yeah I started doing it a lot with that feeling like when that feeling would come in I just sort of like sit with the feeling of anger and just try and observe what it actually was rather than letting it consume me and, and act upon it or whatever absolutely and I mean you know for, as a technical person like you are and, and I am um, I, you know, I love deconstructing things, whether it's, you know, like an old radio I find on the ground or, you know, what the fuck is jealousy? What the fuck is anger? You know, so if you can actually, you know, make it a, a conscious, turn it from a subconscious negative emotion into something that you can like dissect and, you know, it's, it's, it can be actually quite interesting and fun and you, you kind of, you, you, well, for me personally, you know, I kind of might, I'll leave it feeling calm for a start and feeling quite enlightened i guess <laughs> to a very small degree yeah, yeah, there's, a, yeah there's a huge like benefit to it for sure i think if you can uh <clears throat> like for instance i was feeling a bit weird this morning and then meditated first thing in the morning which i should really do every morning i've been f- for the last few weeks meditating last thing at night before i go to bed mm-hmm. but i think it's i think mm-hmm. it's a way better thing to do in the morning right um, yeah because it kind of like sets the tone for your whole day um and yeah then i just noticed like all day today i've just been kind of as soon as something comes in whether it's a feeling or even another interesting thing about sam harris's meditation is that quite a lot of it is open-eyed um meaning you'll sit there with your eyes open and then try and uh try and lose the concept of like the shapes of things and stuff like that and just try and see it all as like a 2d flat of color and try and mm. realize that this is just all light reflection and imagery coming into your consciousness and none of it is actually, you know, it's no no different to a feeling coming into your consciousness or a, you know, a sound coming into your consciousness or, or anything like that. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at feelings as well. Totally. Like all, all, these little, all these little kind of hacks to try and get you to just get a flavor of what it's like to be... Uh, one with everything just to pull that line out of my ass but you know just kind of you you know like the yeah the the kind of becoming feeling like you're part of whatever conscious space is currently around you or i'm I'm assuming you've been doing like the no head stuff are you up to that part Uh, of the lessons yet no i'm not but I did start reading Douglas Harding's on having no head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's pretty pretty much that kind of stuff. And, man, that's the closest I reckon I've come to, you know, like taking acid without actually having any acid huh. is sit, sitting there and focusing on an object and then trying to suddenly switch the perspective so you, you're actually at the object looking at your own consciousness, perceiving it. I mean, I, you know, you don't – I'm sure people get quite close. I don't even get – point zero one percent of the way there but that point zero one percent is enough to make me go what the fuck like some some this is absolutely nuts you know and i find these are all all kind of little uh little hacks people have kind of come up with to to get that 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 oneness and i guess it ultimately comes down to the whole free will um aspect of things is shit's just happening all the time and you you or your consciousness or you inside your consciousness is just kind of part of it, you know? Right. Which is, can be, which can be incredibly calming. Mm. 
Yeah. So you've I mean, been you've, you've been keep, so. you've been you've been keeping it up. You've been doing it. Um. So I'll I'll go through. Uh, yeah, I'm on about day thirty now in the app. Um, oh, dude, that's that's awesome. I'm really really happy to hear that. Eh? Like that's it's really 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 cool. Yeah, but I've had a few breaks. So like I'll I'll do it for like two weeks straight, and then there'll be mm-hmm. like a few weeks where I just forget to do it or I just don't do it. And then mm-hmm. I'll do it again for like a few days and then a few days I won't and so on and so forth. So currently I'm, I've been doing it every day for the last like four or five days or something like that. I mean, the, the, thing, I, the thing I like about it is it's not a huge investment of time. It's like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, mm. And it's funny, man, because it's like even in that 10 to 20 minutes, you can feel these fucking nags of like wanting to look at your phone or wanting it to stop so you can go do other mm. things or just, and it's mm. crazy to me to think that because I'm just like, fuck, it's like not that much time. It's like, 10 minutes like that's nothing but mm. well it's not actually nothing i mean compared to like what you were doing before or what the majority of people do who don't practice anything like this i mean when when have you had 10 minutes to do you know i'm not going to say nothing because it's not doing nothing but just just be you know i mean that's 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 huge compared to not ever doing it yeah, it's a good point because, yeah, it is um, <clears throat> like a lot of people would say that they're just sitting there doing nothing when they're just sitting there at their computer or whatever. But I, I feel like there's a big difference between, yeah, sitting there and paying attention to how you're feeling and paying attention to the things coming into your consciousness versus sitting mm-hmm. there being bored or sitting there being distracted by something that you're trying to distract you. Like l- sitting there being distracted by something, which is exactly what social media is basically, is literally the mm-hmm. fucking polar opposite of what meditation is, I feel like. <laughs> Cause it's like, yep. you're, lit- you're literally just sitting there try like, or scrolling through apps. Like, you, you know, if you, um, have, you probably have done this before. I do it fucking all the time. Um, I'll just sort of like be flicking through the same, like four or five apps on my phone, laying in bed or something. Mm. Um, then you'll get up to your computer and like check Reddit and Facebook all over again, just on a different right, right. medium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And it's, um, if you look into like what you're doing, if you like, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is why you you do this, but if I actually like inspect like what it is that I'm doing at the core of it, it's distracting myself from my feelings. It's basically yeah. me just just not not trying or trying to do something to just like make my my feelings go away. It seems like. Mm. Yeah, I guess I, I haven't really thought too much into into my take on that, but yeah, that 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 does make a lot of sense. I mean. You know, I, I get, I'm, I'm such a low tier noob when it comes to meditation as well. But, you know, the, the, one of the kind of checkpoints, I think everyone has their own little personal milestones of, oh, I'm actually um, getting this was, you know, that feeling of um, when you do actually get distracted or whatever, and you're aware of it, um, that's kind of the practice itself, you know you know if i if i start thinking about something and then i'm like oh, i'm thinking about something and then you kind of place that thought into a spot and you think about where it came from you think about where the thought's going um and you kind of like without any kind of judgment like oh fuck i'm thinking about you know like boobs again or something like you know it's just that that's actually the practice itself and yeah it's um right, it's changed yeah, my did- life man it's changed my life yeah, I would agree. I think it's it's changed my life as well. I like the way Dan Harris puts it. Who um, um I don't think mm-hmm. I don't know if Dan Harris is related to Sam Harris, but uh, I th- he, I think they're brothers, aren't they? They might be, but yeah. um yeah, I like how he he basically says, you just try and sit and be with your feelings, and as soon as a thought comes into your mind, just observe it, mm-hmm. try and let it go, and then try and start again with just concentrating on your breath. And it's like each time you do that is a little bicep curl for your brain. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. The little, the little bicep curl for your brain. Like, yeah. Um, they're not related by the way. So just to clarify that. Oh, did you Google? Um, it? yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I have, I have Google. Um, yeah, no, I'm really, I'm really stoked there. Cause I, I started, I started doing it. Um, I went off to an Island in New Zealand in November um, I had some free time and I stayed by myself for a couple of months um, just to, nothing was, nothing was wrong. I just wanted to really, I really wanted to just dissect a lot of stuff and see what was going on and, you know, see, see how I acted, ha- hang out with myself like I was somebody else, you know, look at how I treated other people, how I used my words, um, a big focus on, you know, uh, 
how truthful I was being to myself, um, whether I was telling myself any lies that I was believing because I, I'm quite conscious of that. I feel like that's something you can like really like brick your brain into. And, um, yeah, I just was like, I'm going to start meditating every day and doing yoga, which really, really helped me. Um, those two combos are really, really good. And it's just, it's literally changed my life. It's just made it so much better. And, um, I'm, I'm not a preacher of it. I don't, um, well, I guess I'm talking about on a public, public podcast right now, but you know, every now and then I'll, um, come across a friend or someone who I'll be like, I, you know, I think they'd really dig this and I'll kind of casually mention it. And, you know, half a dozen have come back and just same kind of feelings as I've had. It's just like, yeah, this shit is working and it's just so cool. You know, it's just so cool. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I, yeah, I've definitely had positive experiences with it. I don't, the, the, the biggest um, takeaway I've had from it so far, and I'm the same as you, I'm like a, I've only been doing it for a, a little while, so I don't know a lot about it, but the biggest takeaway I have from it is, is it's just so easy, or not so easy, it's actually still quite hard, but it's a lot easier or, or I'm a, at least a lot better leveraged to deal with just feelings that come up in day-to-day life, right? It's kind of like mm-hmm. <clears throat> whatever comes up, I'm able to sort of just... And I, and I still don't do this every time, but there's more of a chance of me now than ever um, seeing it come up as just a, you know, of something that's just showing up in consciousness rather than being identified by it and attached to it and then being like, okay, I have to act based on these like impulsive things that are just showing mm-hmm. up. It's like you've got this, uh, you get this switch, you know, that, that becomes more and more powerful. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't flick my switch nearly enough, but, you know, there's sometimes now where I'm just like, oh, I don't have to feel like this right now. Mm-hmm. And you flick the switch and, you know, maybe you, you might not get rid of it, but, you know, at least you can give yourself a little bit of a break. You know, you might be thinking black and white, especially with anger and anxiety. You know, I'm, I get quite black and white and, you know, uh, you know, there's absolutely no resolution. It's just yin-yang, bad, whatever, good. And this way I can just be like, hm, flick a switch, sit there for a second. And I still might not make the right decision based on what's happening. But, you know, I, I just have that, that, that little extra life hack. And from what I've seen, you can get really, really good at it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're into it, man. Really good. And just people listening, um, the uh, app is called waking up by Sam Harris. Maybe you could post, um, Bill, you could post the, uh, one oh, month free post. trial link. Cause yeah, I think, yeah, every, every, if one of us posts the link, the people can get one month. And my recommendation is the um, the people who um, have done it um, that I know, I say stick to day six. Like one to five can be a little bit annoying, but around day five or six, that's when I had my first kind of like, oh, shit, this, there's something here moment. And that was enough to excite me to keep going and going. And yeah, throughout there, there's just random checkpoints will just kind of come in and be and, and kind of reinforce what you're doing. And he's, he's thing- and and he's really he's really cool. He's a, he's a neuroscientist. Um, you can do the guided meditations, and then you can go and he'll talk about why they work, what's going on. He talks to you like you're an intellectual. There's no uh, happy shanti kind of stuff, you know. There's no none of this spirituality kind of talk. So it's um it's really 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 good for active people, I reckon. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, the the moment I had with meditation, I think that really switched me onto it. Was that I was talking to you on the night that it happened. I did like a pretty solid dose of mushrooms at home by myself. I remember that night, man. I was loving it. You were sending me some <laughs> of the coolest messages. I was I had shit to do, man. And I stopped just so I could like leave my chat <laughs> chat open and let you like I'm off. For, I'm going back into the room for ten minutes. I'll come back out. And then 45 minutes later, like, uh, I'm going to go back in for another hour. <laughs> Dude, I meditated on mushrooms that night for like like a couple of hours, I think, mm. or like a long time. And I don't know. Yeah, I was just having a really good time with it. Just like, I mean, obviously, like mushrooms in general make you feel euphoric anyway. So I was just kind mm. of sitting there feeling euphoric and that was like enough to just well, the thing is, is like feeling euphoric, it, it's almost just fun to sit there doing nothing and just feel euphoric, right? Like mm-hmm, you don't need mm-hmm. anything else coming in for that to be Absolutely. fun. But Absolutely. But then to also like switch your whole fucking perception basically onto concentrating 
and like going inwards and stuff it just like made all of that way more intense so i was like oh this is basically like mushrooms on fucking crack <laughs> it's like absolutely yeah i mean you know if you if you had something which is you know like really kind of dopamine serotonin boosting you know you could you know if you, you have a a press pill and you're sitting under a tree and there's wind and you can feel it and you can just sit there and just feel the joy of like the breeze and the 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 scene around you but you know with kind of psychedelics um usually when you go inwards it's usually an involuntarily uh, invo- excuse me involuntary inwards so suddenly you just start thinking about your own ego and your own psyche but this way you can kind of take it and you can jump in with a bit of a toolkit and have a poke around and yeah I'm, uh, i haven't actually done that myself but i'm i'm very much looking forward to to trying that um, not that I take psychedelics very much these days, but yeah, uh, actually Sam Harris has a video on his YouTube, um, <clears throat> about, uh, an experience he had where he ate a heroic dose of mushrooms and blindfolded himself for the entire experience. Uh, I think he did it pretty recently too. And he, okay, he, he's, he's such an articulate dude that it's really interesting mm. to listen to. It's about a 20 minute or 25 minute, just monologue of him talking about his experience and yeah, I'll, because I'll he's. Yeah, because he's so articulate. It's like I don't think anyone has really described like what that ex- – like listening to him describe that experience, it makes me feel like I understand it a lot better than ever hearing, say, Terence McKenna speak about it. Mm. I mean, and, you know, like Terence McKenna, you know, definitely had his own very poetic way of, you know, bringing the concepts of – you know, I mean, you've we've all had friends who have tried to explain their – DMT or ayahuasca experience and it's just it never works I mean there's the closest oh, you can like get it cheapens it right <laughs> the closest you can get is you know you might be around some people and someone's like who's done DMT and you know a few people will be like I have and then you just kind of look around and look at them in the eyes and you'll just kind of nod and be like yep you know but there's no way we're ever going to be able to have a conversation to relate our experiences um uh Dennis McKenna is really interesting to listen to if you haven't um uh, Dennis yeah, was I think I, ter- ter- I heard Terrence him on brother. the Joe Rogan podcast, I think. Yeah, right. He's, he seems to be. He t- seems to speak a little bit more uh, mm, scientifically about the um, adventures that they had and things like that. He's. Uh, I quite enjoy listening to him. Um, the other thing about the um, Sam thing, which I was uh, talking to someone the other day, is. Um, I mean, the fact that he's you know a respected. Uh, is he one of the? What do they call them? The dark web intellectuals or. What's the... Oh, yeah, the intellectual, the IDW. Yeah, something like that. So, I mean, he's... I, I believe him. You know, there's there's people who... who, It's really nice to listen to them speak because you know what they're talking about and you don't have to put up filters and think, oh, I need to cross-check things, you know. Um, and it's just really nice 10 minutes a day having a smart, nice guy with really genuine motives to help you be a better person it's just just 10 minutes a day having that kind of truthful authoritative well articulated figure speak to you i think that alone just puts a pep in your step if that makes sense yeah i'd agree with that i think there's something very comforting about listening to someone who's that articulate right because mm. <laughs> just to know that there is like um <clears throat> that it's possible to attain that level of self-awareness it makes you feel mm. a lot less anxious i think Totally, totally. Yeah, oh, oh, I'm glad you. I look forward to hearing your adventures and catching up down the line and seeing where where you're at with it. And I hope some people listening um, give it a give it a try. Not preaching it, you know, but uh, if you wanna you wanna have a little bit of a trip, give it a go. Stick to day number six. Yeah, for sure. Cool, this man. Is not well, sp- this is not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah! Well, those. Fucking awesome having you on, man. Um, I think we should cut it there because uh, that's like uh, no, I've minutes. got I've got a couple of things I would want to do here. Um, yeah, what's up? I would like to because we've done this a few times at parties and you always have such good responses. I would like to play Would You Rather. Can we do that okay. to finish off? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. come up with it. I've come up with a few here. I'm sure you've got a few in your arsenal, or you can make them up on the spot. And also, I know I, I know you, Bill, and you have the ability to like dissect these incredibly quickly until the question becomes completely null and not actually askable. So you're not allowed to do that. If you do do that, I, I okay. will um, set some more restrictions. All right, very simple. Would right. you rather have ten cents for every beat played in Ableton 
And this is while producing or performing, so not just leaving it on overnight, or 50 cents for every snare you ever hear. And this is in the track, not when you're going through sample collections. You can't automate it. You can't just set snares playing all the time. Um, is the, like, so beats, like, one one bar, so not I can't set the subdivision to, like, 128 or... No, no, you can't do that. So okay. let's say four, four per bar. Four per bar, and we're in 4-4. Four, four. Am, and am the, BP, saying, the BPM um, restriction is 60 to 180. <laughs> okay. And uh, so so it's 10 cents per... So let's say I listen to a hundred, um, a hundred, a one hundred bar song. I get uh, a mm-hmm. dollar. Wait, no, ten dollars. Uh, you get ten dollars, yeah. Okay, but if I just listen to snare sample packs on repeat, I get fifty. No, you cents can't each. listen to snare sample packs on repeat. It has to be when you're producing. So when you're like going over a loop and the snares are just playing in the background, or if you're at a party, or if you're performing. So naturally okay. occurring snares. You so can't adjust your producing habits to make money out of this. Okay, so for um beats uh so four bars is 40 cents mm-hmm. but in the same amount of time two snares which will have happened in that amount of time usually mm-hmm. will be a dollar so i'm mm-hmm. going to go the, the snares okay so but what about if you you know you spend eight hours working on kind of like a breakdown or some you know chords or something then you're missing out on heaps of snares there or heaps of yeah that's true um i'm st- I, I think i'd still go the snares because i think i all, all right, right. Well, imagine if you were uh, Venetian snares. Like how, imagine, how yeah, he'd be rich, absolutely rich. Um, <laughs> he'd be making so much money. All right. Well, let's roll with 50 cents a snare. That's a good answer. Okay, let's move on to the next one. i got a few of these. I hope that's okay. You can cut yeah, yeah. them. Okay. No, 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 it's fine. Um, would you rather ever only use a low-pass filter with uh, 0% resonance? So this is the only filter you can use. You can't use any other type of filter. A low pass with 0% resonance or band notch and high pass with any resonance you want. I would I would go the the three types rather than the one type. You go the three types, all right. Because you, <coughs> yeah. you'd probably figure some way to like reverse the... Uh, yeah, you do some uh, bass stuff. Or... Yeah, okay. Yeah, because you, you, know, um, you do, yeah. Definitely okay, that's do, a good one. Yeah, yeah, I think band passing and notching and stuff like that is you gain a lot more from those than just low pass okay but yeah Um, i I do agree that low pass like you use a lot more than the other three types for sure for sure yeah i Um, I got a question for you um okay would you prefer to have a nipple sized dick or dick sized nipples dick sized nipples or a nipple sized dick and Mm. the and your end your nipples uh get hard if you oh uh, really could they ejaculate uh yeah sure <laughs> absolutely absolutely nipple sized decks man i would i would <laughs> i can already think of 10 ways i can utilize that so that's okay. fine fair enough um would you rather have someone okay let's say you have a a problem and okay would you rather have someone ghost write all of mr bill's tunes but nobody ever knew or you wrote all of your own tunes but 51% of your fan base thought without any doubt that someone was ghostwriting for you. Oh, for sure. I would just prefer to write my own tunes and have my fan base think that that they're, that they're being written for me. Because for starters, there's so many ways to disprove it. Um, I mean, let's assume that there isn't. Because no, 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 no. We have to assume that these 51% people will be always be adamant without being able to change their mind whatsoever. Yeah, I'd still be fine with it because I, I think for the most part what's more important to me and and are you saying in the ghost writing uh one in the in that instance i don't i'm not allowed to write music no like, like let's say you took mushrooms and one day you like you're completely inept at writing music oh and then the, and then i just have to get someone to ghost write for me mm-hmm. okay uh yeah no I'd, I'd take the the write my own music route still because i think the fulfillment that i get from it is more important than what people think Gotcha, gotcha. I got a few more if you if you if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I love this game. Yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to keep going. Okay. I didn't I didn't prepare any for you, but if I think of any, I mean, there's the classic like, would you prefer to fight a duck sized horse or a no? Sorry, is it a, a horse sized duck or a hundred duck sized horses? Which would you prefer mm, to fight? It is a common one, but I don't think I've actually thought about it before. Um, I mean, is is the result mm. to win? I don't know. Yeah, you can't you can't evade it. 
you have to fight. So you're either fighting. Lots I reckon of... I'd fight a duck-sized horse. Eh? I reckon you know you've got a pretty long, vulnerable neck. Um, the beak, uh, the beak would be at a size where it would do pretty significant damage. Let's just say that you can't use a weapon either. It's like a fist fight kind of thing. Yeah, I reckon you just fool, just like jump straight at the neck and just grasp and just take it to the ground and then maybe just maybe just wait it out until it's died of thirst or hunger. Like I reckon <laughs> the weight of the human body could pin down a horse-sized duck. I reckon that would be the way. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I duck-sized, mean, that... horses are pretty strong, man. Like if you had, you had ducks with, you know, like horsepower fucking legs and stuff, um, yeah, I reckon you'd get, you'd, get, you'd get wrecked real quick. Dude, imagine if you had like an ant that was the size of like a pit bull. That shit would be, be I mean, real strong, I think. I mean, is there a colony? Are they able to, like, put out pheromones and get their buddies to come along? Because, you know, ants the size of ants scare me, man. If I, like, accidentally step on them, I'm like, oh, man, all their buddies are going to come soon and be real pissed. Especially no, in Australia. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, one uh, dog-sized ant. One dog-sized ant. Um... It's not like verse anything. I'm just like, I'm just. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, that's that's pretty goddamn terrifying, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I'll agree with you there. Um, yeah. Okay. Would you rather Would you rather have synesthesia where you could see frequency as color? So uh, the resolution of new color, uh, you'd, you'd have a new color per each semitone on the Western scale. Or mm. you see colors, especially. Uh, palettes like sunsets, you know, like gradients, you'd you'd actually you'd actually see those and you'd hear them as like beautiful audio drones that perfectly match up to how it looks. So the the sky or the ocean. But that would be kind of hellish, right? Like walking through the fruit section at the supermarket or something. Uh, let's let's say like remove the scattery ones. Let's just say you know like desert landscapes or things things that look really really nice. Would you like to be able to hear? like a perfect audio equivalent soundtrack of a, a nice kind of drone. Or would I prefer to have synesthesia? Yeah, we, we saw each individual notes as colors. I think I'd prefer to, to have the landscape palette one because I think that would be more like artistically inspiring and I don't really see the other mm. synesthesia as like that useful really. Do you have any, any form of synesthesia you've come across? So synesthesia actually does not just relate to color with notes. It um it relates to just any two emotions or feelings. I think sort of mm. coinciding and mingling with each well, other. What's what's the word with um visual? There's like a specific kind of thesia for audio and visual. Oh, it's um, a chromesthesia, right? Chromesthesia. That's the one. It's a cool. Yeah. Word. Um, yeah. so would I prefer to have chromesthesia or this other special thing? Yeah. Uh, probably the other, yeah, the other one I think, just, and yeah, for the reason I said before, I just think it'd be more inspiring and I think, mm. you know, I went on both, a hike Both today. of them. Sorry, go ahead. I was saying like, I went on a hike today and saw some like amazing views and mm. if they were accompanied by like big luscious pads and shit, like, you know, that, mm. that would have been pretty impressive. And if you had the other one, then you could go home and you could figure out the exact gradients that you saw. You could take a picture and then you could recreate the drone much easier. True, Very but good. I mean, I think I have a pretty decent memory as well. Like I'm, I can usually like hear a thing in my head, and then if I am not at my computer or not at home, I can usually like still imagine it like a week later and still make it. Mm -hmm. uh, a few more here, unless you've got any for me. Uh, um, if I think of one, I'll ask. <laughs> I can't okay. think of them. I didn't, right. You should have told me we were doing this. I would have prepared some. No way would I have told you. All right. Would you rather get an extra 50K budget to spend on whatever you want in your studio or have a live active shark as one of your arms? <laughs> Wait, what? Would I prefer to have 50 grand or a shark arm? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking 50 grand, dude. Why would I want a shark arm? I don't know, man. Like... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. This is this is your question. Like <laughs> shark shark arm. I mean, you could yeah, probably make fifty k from like a couple of good news tabloids with a shark arm. Yeah, but then you. I think like, man, man, masturbating would be a bit of a fucking weird thing, though. Um, yeah, you're stuck like, with a shark arm. It's like imagine like going to the theater and the sharks like hissing and shit, and person behind you is like, "Hey, can you shut your arm up?" 
The sharks piss. You probably have to keep it in water as well. So you need to get like a <laughs> custom aquarium kind of outfit. Right. Yeah. It's like um, they'll, they'll have to make like a whole new disabled area for you at all these places. That's literally just like a a seat at the theater next to a like blow up kiddie pool or something. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, there'd probably be quite a few more problems before we start getting to the stage where we can go out in public. Um, okay, another few yeah, quick yeah. ones. First, first thing I would do with shark arm is try, yeah. try and see how the theatre worked out for me. Yeah, yeah, oh, I've got an arm for a shark. Let's go see the latest Marvel movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, would you rather know everything about Max for Live in an instant? Or come up with a special tone or timbre that renders everyone into a subconscious and highly subjective state until the tone is stopped. You are immune to the tone. Oh yeah, hmm, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably go with the tone because Max for Live stuff seems like it can be learned, but this tone <laughs> thing seems pretty fucking mm. unique. What, what what would you do with this new super tone? Um, everyone, everyone just like kind of like stops and stands there. And just like anything you say to them is a fact and they will not disagree with it. Or, you know, it's a mind control kind of thing. Would you do good? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I mean, so how do I admit it? Can I just admit it like at will from my body or something? No, let's let's say it's something you came up with and like you actually have to play it over a loudspeaker somehow. Okay. So it's probably pretty useless unless you're always carrying around a Bluetooth speaker or something. Or you could just, you know, drop it at one of your biggest gigs and, you know, you suddenly just have like 10,000 people just suddenly quiet and standing there. Mm. Um, you know, I'd probably like take it to one of these protests and just l let it out and convince all the cops that they're fucking dumb. Right. That's, Dude, I went to a protest good. yesterday actually at San Francisco City Did Hall. You? Yeah, it was crazy. How's, how's that all gone? I've kind of uh, was, kept, kept a little bit out of the um, the news recently, but man, I can can't help but see how fuck things are at the moment. Yeah, so I shut my website down today. Um, and oh, just, did you? As yeah, a solitude for, kind of statement. Mm -hmm, yeah, the hashtag oh, the show you, must man. be paused thing, and then oh, Bandcamp's you. doing doing a fee free day thing on uh, June fifth. So every, all the money okay. I make from that fee free day, I'm gonna um, donate to like. I don't know some charity. Oh, that's then, cool. I'm going to join yeah, you on that. Yeah, yeah, you should. Um, but yeah, I went down to San Francisco City Hall with Jan, and we just hung out for mm -hmm. a bit. And dude, there was like a lot of fucking military riot gear, police standing around. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was it was pretty chill while I was there. But I think like towards the end, because they just put all these curfews in place too, right? So like we're not allowed mm -hmm. to go outside after 8 p.m. and shit. And obviously mm -hmm. the protest went until after 8 p.m. So I think once that happened, police started enforcing people to move along. And um, yeah. did, you see, did you see the one at the White House where um, there was a bunch of people out the front or, or something? I, I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, and then Donald Trump, was, he wanted to take a photo out the front of the White House to be like, look, I'm not scared of protesters so oh, he got his yeah. he got his police to like tear gas them all it was outside of a um a church close to the white house right and if i remember correctly the bishop at the church was unaware of it and and it was really really distraught about it um you know that he went for this this photo op at the church um basically basically saying things that go completely against the teaching of you know jesus mm. you know the, yeah that's Mm. Yeah, this is a little bit not okay. Eh? Oh, it's super not okay. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, back. I've to, got two more. Uh, all right. <laughs> I've got two more. These are I, I love that you always have really good answers for these, man. I don't really play this with anyone else. Um, <laughs> I won't say that one. I've already done that one. We'll do another. We'll do another sound one. Would you rather only ever use? An FM synth where the algorithm option is three modulators feeding into each other sequentially and then into a carrier, or two modulators feeding into the third modulator and then into the character carrier. So you know, a pretty, a so, pretty standard. Yeah, so yeah. Say, so, so if you were like uh, looking at the shapes in operator, like would this be sort of like the T shape and then the square shape, or? Uh, no, it would be the like the single one long line one where you know like oscillator A produces the yeah, sound yeah, yeah. and B changes 
A and C mm-hmm. changes yeah, B. Yeah. Or okay, would you so want the, so the t- long the long line one or what? Or or the T shaped one. So uh, oscillator B changes A, but both C and D change B. Yeah, yeah. I'd I'd probably go the long line one. I think long line one. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. It yeah. Seems. Normal. It's a hard one that one man because I, I don't know. Even after all these years and understanding FM synthesis and teaching it a bunch of times. It's just got that, you know, exponential component of complexity where, you know, you just can't really explain to people how to get a certain sound beyond like a percussive sound or whatever, just because such a small change, including the algorithm, can um can can change so much. That's why well, I think I, the tech I think the- that that misses the point of sound design though. Like sound design is a, an exploratory thing and I think it should always be that way. And I think the same about music. It's like you can explain to some degree like what range you know, a chord progression is going to have in terms of its feeling or like what mm-hmm. range a type of sound is going to have with its, you know, design premise. Um, correct, correct. But, but it's always going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge, whatever comes out the other end. But um, I will say that the optimal mode for operator to be on is the square one, I think, because then you get two uh, outputs and two modulators. That's that's definitely my, my favourite I think, but then, but then again, you could just load up to FM since with uh, you know, the um, you could just oh, put them into a instrument rack with the, with the full. Um, that's true. Is it parallel or series? What's, I always fuck that up. You uh, know, parallel with the feeding, series par- series is next to each other. Yeah. Um, okay. Would you rather be completely tone deaf or lose the ability to orgasm? Oh shit. Um, uh, I'd probably. Oh, man, that's a really hard one. I'd probably go without the without the orgasms to be honest really yeah i think so because um well being tone deaf just means you can't sing the notes on key right um i kind of wrote that in the sense of uh you know listening to music was like quite uncomfortable for you producing it was uncomfortable so you know how that some people get complexes where you know like just they they just can't they can't hear the beauty of melody and harmony Mm. i yeah i mean so long as like hearing the beauty in that didn't stop giving me goosebumps sometimes and like making me kind of feel really good. And, mm. you know, so long as I could, you know, keep producing music and all of that kind of stuff, I think that's more important to me than, than having orgasms actually. Awesome. And you killed two birds cause then you've kind of created a form of contraception as well. Um, okay. The very last two, I promise. Would you rather be surrounded by people who brag about their music all the time or people who complain about their music all the time? Probably people who complain about their music all the time. And the reason why is because I think I remember reading somewhere that pessimists are slightly more in tune with reality than optimists in mm-hmm. their um, just the shit that they say. Uh, so I just prefer to be around people who are slightly more in tune with reality. And the very last one, very last one. Would you rather be able, I'm quite proud of this one. I'm quite happy with this one. Would you rather be able to track and travel back in time 10 years to give yourself production tips for one hour or have yourself from 30 years come back right now and give you tips for one hour? Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question because if me went back 10 years ago and was like, here's what you got to do, man, stop fucking around. <laughs> I think um, mm. <clears throat> current me could be, you know, somewhere else you think you guys would have a, have a fight might have a f- fist fight you know you, don't, no. you can't tell me what to do <laughs> no yeah no I'd <laughs> you, old, you, old, you old fuck <laughs> cu- cu- current current me is like hey man trust it we get over the anxiety it's fine and like <laughs> yeah mm. just listen to me and and old me is <clears throat> too busy having an anxiety attack to input any new information at that time um but do you reckon do you reckon in 30 years like you, you know who you are would be somebody that you would want to listen to right now yeah you know yeah i think so i think honestly um well yeah you know yeah i think so i I always think that future me oh sorry current me always thinks that past me was a fucking idiot and future me seems to always think that current me is an idiot so um future me will continue to think that okay gotcha gotcha um how often do you compare yourself to yourself uh all the time all the time do you compare yourself to others very much yeah i would say so actually like uh, not uh not as unhealthy of an amount as i have in the past but yeah i definitely do 
but I, I think, think um sorry go on well, I mean, I, I, a lot of people say, you know, you know, never compare yourself to others. Try to compare yourself to who you were or who you want to be. Um, and that sounds good in theory, but, I mean, I've been trying it as well. How, how have you actually found that? Do you think life is better when you don't compare yourself to others? Oh, like, for say, sure say, is, say, yeah. say someone's doing something awesome and you're like, oh, motherfucker, like, I want to be doing that or, you know, I want to be like them or, you know. So here's, I I here's what I, I have a line that I tell myself every time I feel that way. Ooh, a and mantra. That is, yeah, it's a mantra. Yeah. Um, and that is, if you can't be grateful for what you've got, you'll never be grateful for what you get. You can't be grateful for what you've got. You'll never be grateful for what you get. I like it. I like yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's basically a way of saying like, yes, you don't have what that person has, but if you can't appreciate what you have now, then even when you have what that person has, you're still going to be doing the same thing saying but about a different thing and a different person right what about if that person has time in order to develop a better strategy to appreciate what they've currently got okay that's getting mm-hmm. a little bit too twisted um is that <laughs> is that your is that your own quote or is that from someone I actually that think you i remember heard? seeing I, I think i remember seeing opio tweet it like five years ago and ah. i was just like um and and it, he tweeted it at like just a time when I needed to hear it too. And it like fixed my whole fucking perception for a little while. And I was like, Oh, it's a great line. And I'm not oh, sure. That's if awesome. he, yeah. I don't know if he made it up or if he just read it somewhere and retweeted it, but either way, have, I you, think to- have like, you, have you told him, told him that? Uh, I don't think so. I should get him on the podcast you should, though. You should tell him that man. Like that's, you know, I love hearing shit like that. I'm, and I know him and you do too. He would love to love to know that, you know, something he probably just said in passing is, uh, affected you like that. Old uh, guru, Opio. <laughs> okay, that's all I've got yeah. for the. Would you rather? Nice. Yeah, I wish I wish you had told me so I could have prepared some. I usually... No, man. I, I I fucking hate being asked them, so I like got on the on the sly there. I was oh, going to really? give a disclaimer as a disclaimer to say you're not allowed to actually um, ask any of these questions back to me. Okay. Um, why Why do you not like being asked those questions? Uh, well, I mean, I do, but when people think about them and they know, I mean, you actually know me a lot better than quite a lot of people, uh, you know, like I, I reckon, you know, there's probably 10, 20 people in the world that know how my brain works and you're one of them. I don't know why it's come to that, but you do. So <laughs> I'd be a little bit worried about um, <laughs> the the, uh, the questions that you'd, you'd hit me. Right. Like ask yeah. you some shit that just like... <laughs> leaves you in thought for like a week and a half or something totally i thought you, you have that power of me but you never you never, <laughs> tend to ab- you never tend to abuse it so i didn't want to give you an opportunity to try yeah like on a public <laughs> space for sure oh uh, cool man well fuck I, I probably should sleep i'm pretty fucked to be honest i went for a like I, I think i hiked further today than i've ever hiked which is not even that far i was like eight, seven and a half miles or something but um yeah, oh, so enough, that's a good so. stint, man. Like with with elevation. Yeah, well, like, was, get, it wasn't yeah. like big elevation, like Colorado or whatever, but it was like there was a lot of hills for sure. Was it um just you or did Jan or? Yeah, it was me and Jan. We went to um Stinson Beach, which is like in California, and it's just like yeah, a big, cool trail there that that mm-hmm. we walked on. It was actually called Matt Davis Trail, and the reason I picked it is because that's the name of my acoustician, and I just looked at it on a map and was like Matt Davis Trail, perfect. Yeah, so perfect. Uh, went and, <laughs> yeah, I hiked it. It was good. Uh, how good are they, man? How good are they? Especially with them, especially with someone that you're emotionally connected to. I think it's. Oh, uh, dude, yeah, hikes are great. I'd I'd love to go hiking with you. Let's let's do it at some point. Let's do it. I'm 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 off on a big one this Saturday, so I'm looking forward to it. Let's let's do it, man. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, man. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I've All been right. uh, been wanting to be on these for a while, and it's been really cool. I think you're cool, Bill. Uh, I think you're cool too, man. I think you're a real cool guy. I think you're doing cool shit. And I reckon you're changing the world of production more than you think you are. So keep it up. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. These episodes are edited and uploaded twice a week by Robert Fumo of 303podpro.com. You can also support the show, get early access to episodes and hear bonus content by going to patreon.com forward slash Mr. Bill's Tunes and becoming a patron. Uh, Please rate and review on iTunes unless you're going to be a little shit about it. And all the links to my various platforms are at mrbillstunes.com. Thank you.